Production funding for After Abbey on WPSU comes from The Village at Penn State Claven's Home Furnishings Blaze Alexander Family Dealerships America's Carpet Outlet and from viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to After Abbey, the live post Downton Abbey interactive talk show. Hi, I'm Whitney Sheridan along with my co-host, Lindsay Whistle. Joining us in the studio this evening is Paul Brooke Taylor, executive head chef at Highclere Castle, the real Downton Abbey. In addition to receiving multiple culinary awards for his work, Paul has cooked for British Prime Minister Cameron, members of Parliament, British royalty, celebrities, and Downton Abbey creator Julian Fellows. Also with us is Lisa Heathcote, food stylist for Downton Abbey, Call the Midwife, Mr. Selfridge, Sherlock, and many other television favorites. Lisa has also um, garnered 24 film credits, including The Duchess, Mamma Mia, and National Treasure, Book of Secrets. You can be a part of the conversation right now. We're looking for your questions about tonight's episode, and in fact, the entire series. Call us at 1-800-543-8242. You can send us a note to afterabby at wpsu.org facebook.com slash afterabbytv or on twitter at afterabby. Lisa, Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Hi. You're welcome. Hi, hi, hi. So I guess I wanted to start with you, Paul. Um, tell us a little bit about the history of Highclere Castle and, um, you know, who actually, in fact, lives at Highclere Castle. <laughs> uh, it, it's fair to say, I mean, um, Highclere was first um, put together by the church in the 700s. Uh, the Carnarvons moved in, if you like, in 1776, give or take, and have, have been there ever since. So, um, as for actually living there, um, it's no one right now. It's it's not lived in. So, where do the Carnarvons live? Well, the Carnarvons have a beautiful little cottage at the back of the castle. Um, it's fair to say that when we entertain or the Carnarvons are, are out to impress, and obviously, you know, Lord and Lady C will move into the castle and um, have a great time. Okay. So um, there's a lot of filming that goes on. How much of the year is Downton being filmed at, at Highclere? Well, to be honest, um, they take about 70 days out of our diary. Um, and obviously that's mm. five days out of a, a working week. And um, it, it's, it's, it's a big chunk. It really is. But they, they take it over the whole year. I think it, it's important, I guess, they get uh, all forms of weather. And uh, it's no good just having rain, as it does a lot in England. <laughs> so uh, they need sunshine occasionally. And how has your life changed, or how has life changed at Downton, or at Highclere since Downton Abbey? Uh, yeah, I've got to be honest. I mean, when uh, I first went to Highclere, what, seven years ago, um, we had great rural connections. We had a, a wonderful shooting um, land, and we had great wedding business, and it was all top end, and we were an undiscovered gem. And then, uh, as you know, Julian came for dinner uh, with, obviously, Lord and Lady Carnarvon. They had a conversation. I, I wasn't privy to it. I just, I just cooked the meal. And um, Downton was born. And it's fair to say it's changed us. It's, it's changed us a lot. It's made us a lot more popular. Um, I, I, I always relate it to, you know, Tutankhamun, um, Howard Carter and the Carnarvons finding Tutankhamun in Egypt. You know, the gem was always there. High Clear was always there. Um, but we're just so glad that Downton came along and they found us. And um, yeah, we're here today, and I'm, I'm sat on here talking to you, so uh, life's certainly changed. Well, whatever you cooked might have had something to do with Julian Fellows. It, it, it goes on my CV <laughs> that I, I basically am the ingredients that made the show happen, um, which probably isn't factually correct, but uh, it, it's a nice thing to have. I'm wondering what's it like for both of you to work in this beautiful historic building, and, and you know, I think it's funny, you also said that it's actually not in Yorkshire. No, it's not. It's uh, in a little place called Newbury. Uh, I guess um, for your viewers, it's uh, west of London. Um, you know, it's, it's about an hour outside. It, it's it's based in Yorkshire in respect to the TV program, but the actual building itself, yeah, it's in Newbury. Um, we get a few visitors that come. They, they get it wrong. You know, they have these new sat nav contraptions. They mm -hmm. type in the words Downton Abbey, mm -hmm. and then we get a phone call about an hour later saying, hey, where, "Where are you guys?" <laughs> and we said, "How are you lost?" Yeah, and they're, they're looking for Downton, and, and we're still known at home as, as Highclere Castle. So, uh, yeah, they, they find us eventually, and we, we hope they have a good time. So, and so, Lisa, what's it like for you to actually be on on set in this beautiful? Well, it's place. wonderful. I mean, it's it's a lovely. I've I've been doing it since the the series began, so my car sort of takes me on its own now, um, and it's very. Be I have to go very 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 early in the morning to arrive because we start filming at seven. So um, I have the privilege of seeing sort of the dawn come up and it's very beautiful. 
And my work, I mean, I, I have kind of a lovely job because I go to so many different beautiful houses because most of the time I'm employed for historic food in a scene that calls for historic food. So that, by nature, is in a lot of beautiful old houses. Um, so, but I think probably High Clear is one of the, the most attractive. That so I've kind. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's rather magical. Because everybody mm. does it with its own microclimate first thing in the morning. The mist takes a long time to lift. It does. Because it's on a plateau. So I kind of invariably in the winter kind of come up in curling mists. And so I've heard that that has presented some challenges maybe in season one, this microclimate. Can you, can you share <laughs> a little bit about It is very cold. Can I you share a little say. bit about that? Well, I, I, yeah, I'm actually not cooking in the house because uh, I need to be near the set, which is the dining room. So I'm outside in the car park um, in an easy up, which is um, a tent and I have tables. And um, I often, when it's very, very cold, I've been known to be working and I turn round and I was making Tony's Rossini and I turn around and there was, the gravy had sort of iced over. So it's kind of, it's tricky. And also things blow off the plate going in. So yeah, it's had its challenges, but that's the nature of my job. I mean, whenever I, go somewhere I very rarely have a kitchen facility that I'm going to work from it's normally a table a cupboard um, barely a cupboard and I've got to pull things out the hat and just get it into onto the set well uh, tell us a little bit about exactly what a food stylist does and oh. what exactly you do from the point where you wake up in the morning to prep everything and take well, the set. <laughs> Well, yes, I wake up in the morning and think, oh, are we Edwardian? Are we 17th century? Where are we today? When I'm really busy, I get down to the fridge and I'm sort of open. And I think, what am I taking this morning? Where am I going? Um, it's, I, I do most of the prep for um, a production the day before. And I'm part of the art department. So if we go back a bit further, I will have uh, been speaking to the set dresser and the art director and the designer about what their requirements for a production would be. And then I go away and think about what food might be appropriate for that scene. And sometimes it's scripted. So if it is chicken mousse or saba mousse or whatever, I've got to kind of think about that. And then I've got to prepare it, then I've got to get it there, they've got to unpack it, and then I've got to make sure it's all handled safely. And then finally, I've got to get it onto the plates for the actors to eat. So it involves quite a lot. Wow. Yeah. You talked about historic um, food styling. What kind of research do you have to do to know sort of the dishes of the day? Well, I, I've been doing quite a while. <laughs> and actually, that, um, that's one of the joys. That's the best part of the job is actually doing the research. Um, and I, I go to archives and I go to old houses. And actually, most old houses like High Clear yeah. would have um, um, their menus or and also oh, yeah. the old cookery books and usually I whenever I'm at a sort of old sort of house I do ask if they've got um, an old cookery book and people are very happy to share and uh, then you know I speak to historians um, and I read and I go to museums and paintings are also a fantastic source of um, information especially sort of 16th century because obviously there's no photographs but it's amazing how many photographs you find um, in old books I also kind of rifle through old um, books in uh, antique shops and things wherever I am in the world I'm always on the hunt for something which I can then recreate so yeah that's always the fun bit that's really the fun bit wow well, I want to go to a call we have Patty from State College on the line Patty welcome to After Abbey oh, good evening thank you for taking my call I have a couple of questions, very different from each other. First, Isabel is living a very comfortable and privileged lifestyle, and I wondered where her financial support came from. Would she have been provided for after Matthew's death in some way, since he didn't really leave a real will? And the second question is about Lady Mary. Uh, she seems to have a very close relationship with her maid, Anna, mm -hmm. even better than with her sister, Edith. And would this have been the usual situation for a lady's maid and her, her person that she was working with? Well, I think for the first question we go about Isabel Crawley, I think she would have been provided for from Matthew's estate. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and then as for Anna and Mary, 
I think that there are a lot of relationships that we see on Downton Abbey between the servants and yeah. their masters that are yeah. a little yeah. romanticized. They're a little romanticized. Yeah. What do you think? I, I don't think, um, certainly today at Highclere, which is, you know, it, there's a scenario where uh, Lord and Lady Carnarvon, yes, yes, listen, I'm there to serve them, I'm, I'm there to cook their dinner, but they also take great care in looking after us. You know, um, they, they've helped me out personally before, um, and I, I really respect that. They're not just your normal boss, it's nine to five, you go home, and your boss stops caring about you. Um, I, I like to think that Lady Carnarvon can come to me and if she needs a little bit of a vent, she'll, she'll vent, and uh, it stays between Lady Carnarvon and I. Um, it, it, it's a, it's a personal relationship on a professional level, and um, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of that. It, and it's very true, you, you do end up talking to the people you spend the most time with, mm -hmm. be it family or not. Um, yeah, and it, it's, it's a, I'm, I'm honored to have that relationship with Lady Carnarvon. And in fact, she's helped you out yeah. a lot in your life. Um, I'm thinking she, of yeah, she did. I mean, four years ago. Yeah. yeah, four years ago, I, I, <laughs> clashing with Series 1 and Mrs. Patmore, it, it, it was um, an unhappy coincidence. I, I took a sporting injury. Uh, I took a ball to the face, it's as simple as that. And uh, I went to our local hospital and I was diagnosed for a lack of vision. And it was some three months later, still having this vision problem, that Lady Carnarvon came into the kitchen and said, um, how are you doing? And I, I said, yeah, generally I'm, I'm still not seeing. Um, I'm getting a little bit concerned. She then uh, took it upon herself to phone her personal eye doctor, Charles Sandy, uh, and said, you're going there today. I, I had the Duke of Kent coming for lunch. And I was like, well, I've got this lunch to do. And she said, no, Paul, you're, you're going. And um, do you know what, I, I went, it, it w wasn't the great, greatest news of my life. I'd, I'd actually had a stroke. Uh, I'd had a blood clot in my brain. And it was only thanks to Lady Carnarvon that that was diagnosed as quickly as it was. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure with, with the greatness of the NHS is mm -hmm. back in the UK, we'd have got there eventually. But so it was someone like Lady Carnarvon in my corner, the diagnosis came through a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. And she gave me some great marital advice. I've got a beautiful wife and, and two children at home. And um, after I was diagnosed, she, she came to the kitchen, she put her arm around me and said, remember, your wife married you before you stroke, so just get on with it. And you know what? It was the best advice I ever received in my life. And to this day, I, I will never forget it, and I'll always be incredibly respectful for her. So there you go, yeah. We, we do have good relationships with um, both Lord and Lady Carnarvon. Yeah, because everybody's very close. I mean, I think going back to sort of the damn thing, everybody um, lived very closely. And mm -hmm. um, you, you kind of forget that at this period, there was no television, right. and uh, there was no internet. And so you were socializing very much more with the people who were close to you, close around you. So you became quite close to the people who were around you. And they also and had to life be was very, different. very free with communication around yes. the servants who were always there. So. Yes, Absolutely. yes. I yeah, think you, they, they were privy to what's going on. Mm -hmm. your, your, li your lives were sort of interconnected. Mm -hmm. You know, what, they would depend, you know, you're dependent on the servants and the servants are dependent on their masters. So it's a kind of, it's a wonderful square. Right. And, and it's a trust thing, you know, because you can't just have um, someone like Lord Lady Carnarvon come through and you may catch them at a bad moment. They may say something in a, say something in a corridor that you're not supposed to hear. And, and they trust you not to um, not to share that. Mm -hmm. And um, that's not just about picking up your salary at the end of the month and just say, I'm just a cook. You know, you're a part of that family, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's a good place to be. Well, we know that happens a lot on Downton over here. <laughs> I know, nobody <laughs> should ever whisper anything in a hallway. At that <laughs> There's always someone standing right. behind the door. Usually Thomas, but yeah. <laughs> if you're just joining us, this is After Abbey, the live post Downton Abbey interactive talk show, and we invite your correspondence. Call us at 1 800 543 8242. Send a note to afterabbey at wpsu.org, facebook.com slash afterabbeytv, or on Twitter at afterabbey. We go now to Erica from Blue Knob Mountain. Erica, you're on the line. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. I'm very well. Oh, yeah. I have a, a comment, actually, about ISIS. There was oh. something said about that last week, but no one said much. Um, ISIS is getting older, and mm -hmm. I'm a dog trainer. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that with his listlessness, and he doesn't seem like he's eating and everything, that I don't think that it will be a long time before the dog will be, have to be replaced or that the dog dies. Because, oh. you know, dogs like that only live between 9 to 11 years. 
normally. That would be a sad loss. Kind of sad. Yes. And what would we do you with know. the opening credits? I know. Well, I <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the most iconic Downton image. <laughs> I know. Well, we'll, ha we'll have to wait and see how this plays out, but that's that's um, a good prediction, Erica, to hear from you. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens. And Isis was a little a little down this episode. This episode, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah, I think absolutely. we'll have to wait and see what happens there. But thanks for that prediction, Erica. Um, one thing I wanted to ask both of you about well, we definitely see the presentation, Lisa, yes. is so important on Downton Abbey, and you do a, such a beautiful job oh, with the food. <laughs> it's like thank a work you. of art that we see. You know, thank I'm you. thinking of those cakes and even the way that the food is served with the chicken with the legs on and everything. Oh. And <laughs> I think there's there have been times where a full lobster comes out and oh, it's, yes, it's standing yes, up. Yes, I yes, mean, yes, that was, yeah. Oh, stop, you're sweaty. making me hungry. Yeah, no, <laughs> tell us a little bit about the, the presentation, and, and is that of the time period? Is oh, that yeah, uh, the totally. food style? Oh, yeah, totally. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's that. part of the research that I do. Um, and actually, uh, I was also doing Mr. Selfridge at the same time at some point, and I had to kind of remember what I'd done for Mr. Selfridge and what I'd done for Downton Abbey so that I got, didn't have the same thing going on, sort of a, almost parallel. And it, it's, I take references from books, Mrs. Beaton and Mrs. Marshall, and then I've got some magazines of the time. And so they are actual pictorial references that I then recreate. And at this point, there was still very intricate um, detail in the, uh, in the design and in the presentation. And they decorated the edge of the plates. And actually, you know, it's sort of what I do is kind of sometimes a bit clumpy to the eye but it's just going to kind of whisk past the camera and that's what the camera sees. So mm -hmm. um, I might make things slightly bigger, and it's, but it's, it is historically accurate and um, it's, you know, it's, it's colourful and that's really what I'm thinking about when I'm doing it. It's sort of kind of hair and makeup for food is what I and, say. And how yeah. does this all stand up under the lights for how and how many hours would it take to shoot a typical dining room scene? Oh, well, depending on what, how long the scene is. Okay. Um, it can take all day if it's, you know, a very long scene. Um, and if it's a short scene, you know, it'll be kind of half a day. And I have to do what's called repeats for any scene that I do. Um, so I always have a discussion with the art director. Um, how many pages have we, are we actually shooting that I can kind of gauge how long it might possibly take to do that scene. And then um, I'll have to refresh the food while we're actually filming because obviously if it's standing on the plate for a long time it's going to start to wilt and look sad so I've got to have kind of more watercress more more cucumber or indeed if they eat it uh, then obviously I'm going to have to replace it but most of the time yeah they do eat it but they'll eat sort of little bits around it they're not going to eat the entire plate so we'll just be replacing one part which is called refreshing the plates so yes I've got to do a lot of repeats and when I do jellies when I do sort of small jellies or things for putting I usually do sort of four or five times the amount needed. So if there's 10 people around the table, I'm doing at least 50 or 60 jellies wow. just because I'm not too sure how they're going to behave um, when they're on, when the, that's the food, not the actors. Um, <laughs> so, when they're on I don't set. know, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. it's a giant, it looks, sounds like a giant catering job. It is. It's, like, it's kind of slightly like doing a restaurant. It's like yeah. short order restaurants. Right. You know? And I work with the prop men and they'll come out and they're sort of like, what, they're like waiters and they'll come and say, we need another cucumber or we need some more watercress or, oh, we're going to have to reset the whole lot. And, and especially when we break for lunch, Everything's got to clear. All the plates are obviously going to have to be cleared off the table, and I take lots of photographs of the way the plates are looking at that point, mm -hmm. so that when we come back after lunch, I can recreate it looking exactly the same with fresh food. So if it's sort of halfway eaten, it's got to be exactly like that. Otherwise, if you put a tomato there and you go back to a scene when it's editing, the tomato is going to be jumping right. around the plate. Mm -hmm. So you've got to make sure it's exact when you go back to it. Well, we go now to Kathy from Manor Township. Kathy, welcome to After Abbey. Hey, hi. Thanks for having me on. Um, I wanted to ask your opinion about the relationship between Carson and Mrs. Hughes. It seems like each week they give us another little tidbit to make us think that their relationship is more than professional. Oh. So, I don't <laughs> well. know. Is Carson really that stuffy that he believes <laughs> that he's courting a woman in the way he does? I just wanted your 
your opinion. Well, last week we know he asked Mrs. Hughes, would they go in on a property together, perhaps? No, I, yeah. I still think I, their, their, I, their relationship has always been so professional, and I, I feel like yeah. they've sort of developed that in past seasons and then just let it go and that they're just content, you know, sharing this, this life together as I, just I, co-workers. I think, I think he's chasing the lady. You do? I, okay. I do. i got I got to say. Um, I think yeah. he's. The gentleman's he's opinion. just being Absolutely. very English about it. Yeah, he's it's, it's an English oh. trait. We, we don't just rush in. It, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's not seen polite. We would love so, to see uh, that seashore scene again, you know, mm. something like that <laughs> at, the, at the end of the season. That would be a beautiful wrap to the season again. So. Yeah. I, 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 think, I think he's. There's an attraction there for him. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, I, I think so. Maybe the cottage that they invest in together can be a home for them someday. That would be great to see. <laughs> That'd be lovely. That'd be yes. lovely. <laughs> that would be lovely. Now, Paul, so we were talking about the presentation that they do on Downton. What's it like at High Clear? Wow. Um, presentation in food? Yes. Not like I, I, I've, I've got to say. Do you guys, uh, yeah. do you guys a we lot see of Mr. Estimate, Carson yes. measuring out each place sitting? And, uh, Jim, we, and we, we've got a, a highly professional front house team, mm -hmm. you know, and the, the standards have been set mm -hmm. and the it's, it's so familiar from the show to the family that there's lots of similarities mm. and th there is a, there's a lot of attention to it you know that the menus are well written that they're incredibly well cooked um no they are yes they are, <laughs> they are. they're well cooked of course um, you it's know, too and, and, not and, to look at and they're well yeah, yeah th and that's the difference i mean I, I respect lisa's job to spend all that time preparing food and getting it look beautiful and then to have somebody say cut and then you have to go back and do it all over again. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm so lucky in respects that, yeah, we, we make the dining room table look beautiful, we, we serve beautiful food, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that 99% of my food gets consumed and, you know, I, I would... Yeah, I, well, when you're eating your food, it's to eat it because it's delicious. Absolutely. I mean, my food is very secondary, really, to what it's a, about. I mean, it's about it's the acting, it's about it's the story, like, yes. You've worked well, on. Yes, but you're, yeah, and that, for me, I've enjoyed sort of the sense of kind of creating something that hopefully looks pretty. But, um, yeah, your food is the real deal. And but, mine is real. Yeah. But, but so many it, of the know, dining room... hero food. So many of the dining room scenes are such a huge part of Downton because that's where everybody comes together. Yeah. So the food really is such a huge part of the show. Mine, mine yeah. gets eaten by, I mean, if it's family, maybe up to 50 people. If we're doing a wedding, yeah, which we do do at High Clear when we're not filming. Ralph Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually not allowed to talk about people that have come to the castle, but yes, we did. It we was, saw it on Twitter. <laughs> You're going to get me so much trouble. Um, yes, actually, he it's did tweet on it. Social media. He, he did tweet it first, <laughs> so I, I should be okay. Uh, yeah, we did. We, we were really lucky. Yeah. Um, Ralph and Ricky came over for um, Ricky's birthday, mm -hmm. and um, we, we trust they had a fantastic time. And you know, they they ate with the Carnarvons, so it was it was yeah, a lovely event. And I was just saying that my, my food gets consumed by you know 40 people. Lisa's food gets seen by 10, 11, 20 million people, you know. All it, around the world. Yeah, <laughs> all around the world, yes. <laughs> that jelly has wobbled in many a sitting room. <laughs> yeah, it has. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> How big of a staff are you actually working with? I, it, it depends on the event. Um, to be honest, I, I have three chefs under me right now, which um, are, are great help. And um, I'm, I'm lucky they make me look good a lot. You know, it, it, it's... it's we are a very small team and we're a very professional team. And then front of house, you know, we, we only have really three full-timers. Uh, we obviously have a housekeeping department and a housekeeper. Um, but when we do a wedding, we, we do expand our staff and we, we have a trusted agency that we use to help us cater for that. Because we aren't, as I said to you, no, nobody lives in the castle. You know, it, it's, right. not, it's not a full-time thing. So, you know, when the castle's quiet, we, we don't need wages to be paid that people aren't working. So, yeah, we're, we're quite small in our numbers. We're quite a tight, tight little team, but that, that makes it personal. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, the, as you said, the, the relationships develop between, uh, between us and Lord and Lady Carnarvon. It's good. Now, would you like to have worked in the kitchen with Daisy and Mrs. Patmore? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that is a question. Um, do you know what? <laughs> Depends it, what role, I suppose. The, 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 yeah. the historian to my left here will tell you that you know, I have a lot of modern day kit that helps me do <laughs> <Yes>. my job. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, they would have been working. Well, I'm saying they're working harder. He's got the kit. He's got all the gadgets to make it work. <laughs> I, having kits and gadgets means you can lower your man levels. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've spoken to Mrs. Patmore, and, and I've, I've often said, you know, next time you're in the area, pop in, come say hello, and we'll... Uh, have a chat about it. It's, it'd be a lovely, uh, lovely thing to do. 
And have they have has Leslie Nickel and Sophie McShara, you know, Mrs. Pat Moore and uh, Daisy picked up any cooking tips as as you've taught them how to do these preparations? Uh, well, uh, yes. I mean, I I think they may have kind of got more handle on what's going on in the kitchens, understanding it more. And there are kind of there's also the prop boys who are talking to them as well. So they're kind of surrounding with people doing things for them in the kitchen. So I think, yeah, by osmosis, they've definitely picked things up. They must have done. <laughs> you'd hope so. I can't be you honest. Yeah, you, you, yeah. You're surrounding yourself with a true professional. Why, why wouldn't you Why wouldn't you take the opportunity and learn? It's, sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. I think, yeah, they're interested. Good. <laughs> well, that's, it's, it's fun to watch them on, on uh, camera, and I'm sure they are picking up some great tips from you, Lisa. <laughs> We go to a Facebook question now Ooh. that I want to read. It, um, why do they put a cloth over the wine when pouring it from the bottle? And that's Mr. Carson when we see him preparing the wine. And that was that, comes from Heidi, a Facebook question from Heidi. Was that when he was, um, he was straining He's straining the, the wine. Oh, yes, that's too. taking the sediment out. Mm -hmm. That's, and in, that's in the old bottle, and it's just gently turning, because if there's sediment, in a vintage bottle, it'll be yeah. red wine, it'll only ever be in red wine because the sediment sinks to the bottom. And the process, you know, old vintage wines is not as refined as now. And uh, that's where the flavor, so there are these wonderful, as demonstrated, and gently tilting the bottle, very gently, right. gently. And it's going through the muslin, catching the sediment, and then putting it into um, the bottle. And my, and the canter, thank you, and then it's aerating it so that it, the whole wine will taste better. And of course, and, now yeah. we have gadgets to do that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm told. I mean, you know, it, it's it obviously no. I mean, the process of wine yeah. has, has changed. You know, the, yes. the sediment we mm -hmm. would hope we wouldn't be yeah. in the bottle. Yeah. Um, you know, but as, they, as Lisa was saying, you know, back in that day, then yeah, you had to remove the sediment. So I mean, vintage the vintage bottles now. If you're mm -hmm. opening a very old vintage bottle, you're still going to have to decant to remove the sediment. We, we actually still do it with Lord Carnarvon's port. Yeah, um, there'll be sediment. And, and there's, in that. there's certain red wines that yes. we do it for. Yeah. Um, I mean, Lord, Lord Carnarvon's got a fantastic cellar. Yeah. You know, most people that come to visit us and uh, are entertained by the Carnarvons, they often bring up a, a relatively nice bottle of wine as a, as a little thank mm -hmm. you, and mm -hmm. uh, it ends up in a cellar ready for a, a private evening. Mm -hmm. Well, we go now to Bernadette from State College. Bernadette, welcome to After Abbey. Hi. Um, I actually, I think my question was answered while mm -hmm. I was waiting to come up. Um, the, this is for the food stylist. Okay. So she does also prepare the food that Mrs. Patmore makes mm -hmm. and serves to the servants. Right. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, sometimes, um, I'm losing a bit here. Yeah, sometimes I uh, do the food for below stairs. Um, and then sometimes if it's really simple and quick, the prop boys will do sort of toast or bread or a pie or something. So, but uh, yeah, I do do a good percentage of what's going, or maybe I, they may, we might discuss what needs to be served. And perhaps if it's very simple, then the art department might sort of put it together. And now that is actually not filmed at High Clear, is it? No, that's... Tell us about that. <laughs> well, yes, because uh, Paul gets a lot of questions about this. Um, that is at... The downstairs uh, scenes. Are, yes, yeah. the downstairs scenes are um, all uh, at a studio mm. because it needs to be kind of film friendly and camera friendly and being and also because we're there quite a lot mm -hmm. so you know we can't be at I'm just full of modern equipment like yeah it's, it's <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 so yes <laughs> yeah so um yeah that's and that's often the case with um yeah. dramas that uh, you know you're in studios the external are of you know houses and then you go into a studio I mean there are, yeah, Mr. Selfridge is exactly the same. You know, right. there's externals, and then we're back in the studio. I mean, it's fair to say my, my kitchen is incredibly old, but it, it just doesn't fit with, with the Downton right. Abbey yeah. you know, ambiance that they're trying to create because it, it's just not factually correct, so yeah. it can never have worked. Right. We have a tweet now I want to go to. Um, Christian is tweeting, Last season, the great chef Auguste Escoffier entered the story. Will we see his influence served in dishes and kitchens at Downton? What we already do. Ooh. Yeah. Well, we already do because that's where, you know, Mrs. Patmore or any chefs of a grand house at this point, mm. and still do. We still do. I'm sure Paul. I mean, yeah, you know, you, you know, the dishes that he created 
um, have been sort of over the generations, the elements are still there. So yes, definitely. So it's like Lisa was saying, you know, we, we have a fantastic uh, archive at, at the castle, and you, you'll go through recipes, you'll, you'll go through all menus, and you, you'd be stupid not not to pick up the tips, not to not to learn from these people. Yet yeah, that they're great yeah. chefs. You know, you should um, take them, take their advice, and and run with it. Yeah, put your own little tweak on it, but um, embrace it. It's they were absolutely. The first they were the first celebrity chefs. Yeah, yes, absolutely, but, yeah. but yeah, they were early celebrity chefs. And yeah. They did amazing things, really amazing things at, at the period. Especially um, in their time, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. and even more complicated than um, the food, you know, chefs, patisserie chefs mm -hmm. um, uh, are able to do now. They they did extremely complicated sort of sugar work, etc. Yeah. So yeah, that's definitely going to appear at some point. <coughs> We go now to Stephen from State College. Stephen, welcome to After Abbey. Thank you for taking my call. Hello, Stephen. And what's your question? Yes, my question is, why do you think Mary is so insensitive to Lady Edith's predicament, <laughs> given that you know she just experienced the death of her husband mm -hmm. very unexpectedly, and now all of a sudden her sister finds herself in the same situation having lost the man she loved, you would think Lady Mary would be more sensitive. Wow. I think it's safe when you, when you have a trio of sisters, certainly at the beginning, right. I, think, I think everyone's different. I, I'm very different from my sister. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, think, um, I think when you've had the experience yourself and you've got over it, um, you know, perhaps it's a case of being there, done there, come on, get up. They have yeah. a, a very yeah. interesting uh, dynamic. Yeah. They do. <laughs> they do. So. But, yeah. I always harken back to that moment after um, Sybil passes, and, and she says, oh, do you think we can be better? And she goes, oh, probably not really. <laughs> <laughs> but is, isn't that just honesty? Isn't that um, almost yeah. a, a good trait to be um, honest? That's and, true. And not slightly misleading. <laughs> of course we could be friends. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, until tomorrow afterwards. when you took me off. <laughs> Uh, yeah. What do you yeah, think, Lisa? Yeah. I, well, I think that, yes, I think it sort of makes for an interesting storyline. It definitely does. I think that interesting viewing. So, uh, yeah, wait and see what happens. We have just uh, about 90 seconds left, and real quick, I wanted to ask both of you, um, you know, Lisa, what, a, what is probably your best food memory that you have oh. on Downton? You can say working with me yesterday, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, working with Paul, working with Paul day yesterday. <laughs> Oh, I think they're all kind of fun when I get, you know, scripts and I can read through and just sort of enjoy kind of dreaming up what it might be. Sometimes I sort of dream up more um, than I need to be doing, but um, I always like making a good jelly. I'm always enjoying doing a good jelly. A good jelly. A good jelly, <laughs> I think probably. And Paul, so when is uh, season six going to start filming? When are you guys going to expect those trucks rolling up to the gates? Do you know what? I I'm sat here with you right now, and I know the trucks are arriving tomorrow. Really? Absolutely. Tomorrow? Absolutely. Tomorrow, back in the UK. And uh, yep, there they start filming again. Wow. Well, we thank both of you for joining us You're tonight. Welcome. Thanks mm -hmm. to our guests, Paul Brook Taylor, executive head chef at Highclere Castle, and Lisa Heathcote, food stylist for Downton Abbey, Call the Midwife, Mr. Selfridge, Shelf Sherlock, and many other TV favorites. And thank you for watching. Please be sure to like us on Facebook. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash TV. As always, we hope you'll join us next week for Lindsay Whistle. I'm Whitney Sheridan. Thanks for all of us at WPSU. Have a great night.